спасибо за приглашение. Моя презентация называется Криптография Сегония. И я буду переходить на английский, потому что не все понимают русский. Так что, во-первых, спасибо за приглашение. Я очень рад быть на этой конференции. Я просто провел несколько дней в Санкт-Петербурге. Это красивая страна. And today I'd like to give you my, my perspective on um, cryptography um, today. Uh, so my perspective, I'll just give you a few words by, about my background, what I'm doing, what I've been doing. Um, so today I'm principal researcher at a company called Kuleski Security in Switzerland. I'm doing mostly what we call applied cryptography, uh, which means sometimes doing code reviews, reviewing implementations, source code, uh, doing consulting in various areas, more or less related to cryptography. Can you read the slides? Good. And I also been doing a lot of um, outreach, you know, talking about crypto to people who are not experts, but who would like to learn about about our fields, who would like to to understand better cryptography, because people often have this impression that cryptography is, is hard and uh, very complex. So I try to to simplify it for these people. Uh, so before that, my background, I got a PhD in cryptography, I was doing this uh, research at EPFL in Switzerland, and before that I did um, my master's in, uh, in Paris, France. So after my PhD, I started, I moved from the academic environment to industry, and then I started doing completely different kind of cryptography. I, I went from the academic rigorous crypto that you know, to the industry pay TV crypto, which is totally different. You have completely different requirements, and it, it's like a different world. Uh, it's not what you would expect after you study. how to learn uh, different concepts, how to learn about hardware engineering, about software engineering, about what the word security can mean in this environment. Uh, I've also been doing quite a few open source projects, maybe you know the hash function, hash function, function Blake 2, uh, the function zip hash that are now widely used, and um, you can find them in OpenSSL, in Python, in many different places. So it's hard to learn about what people from the open source community need, what this kind of user want from from us, from cryptographers. I've uh, been doing the password hashing competition to develop a new password hashing standard, and something called crypto coding to help developers uh, make fewer mistakes in their code. So just some very small commercial plug. I recently wrote a book, and I did some, what people say, offensive research, like trying to find problems in other people's cryptography. So I had, for example, been paid to find bugs in wire, the wire application, and I've not been paid for finding bugs in, in single. But in these two cases, it's like using the cryptographic skills to improve the security of, of real products. Well, to to do something actually useful. So in this way, I'd like to, to explain from my point of view what it takes to be a cryptographer today in, in 2017. So first, we have to define what is a cryptographer. Uh, I've split in maybe three different eras really to simplify a lot. So the classical era was, well, before computers or using this kind of thing. And the goal then was just to to make the message secrets, maybe for a few hours. If you read the um, the book by August Kirchhoff, who is well known for the Kirchhoff principle, he says that a message has to be secret for only a few hours, maybe four hours, because he was doing this in the context of the First World War, when they had to transmit messages within the military organization. So oh, maybe we're going to attack this position, and it didn't matter if the message was descripted or decrypted. A few days later, they just wanted to be secret for a very short time, and they were only working on letters, and obviously they didn't have the computers, the base that we, we have today. Uh, also, the attackers were relatively simple because people were, people were much less educated about crypto. Uh, if you look at the um, reference to, about cryptography in the Roman or Greek text, they, some places they say that maybe the attackers, they were just illiterate, so just the fact of writing using letters uh, would make the message uh, undecryptable by most people because they just can't read it. So it was relatively easy to to ensure security of this kind of messages in this context. But later on, so I say 1960s, maybe, you know, give or take 10 years, depending on 
um, where you are. Uh, there was a big switch from the classical era to the computer era, where now we had computers that do calculations much, much faster than a human can. So instead of working with letters, uh, with just manual operations, we work with bits, and we work with transistors, which are extremely small, instead of mechanical operations, like even the Enigma machine and its photos can be described as a basic computer, but as a matter of fact, it was just a bunch of mechanical operations. Okay. So what did this change concretely? Uh, first of all, we had major breakthrough mathematical results. So as you know, the public crypto was discovered or publicly discovered in the late uh, in the in seventies. The Fiedman RSA, and it totally changed the the way we view crypto cryptography, and it brought many new applications, many new IDs, digital signatures, key agreement, RSA. So now, the crypto we use today, RSA, the man and ECC, a ticker of cryptography, it actually dates back from the 70s or from the early 80s for a ticker of crypto. So in 20 years, 30 years, we have only so much progress. So what changed to it is that we didn't care only about secrecy, we cared about other notions like integrity of messages, authenticity, so the availability of data. Can you use cryptographic techniques to determine if one network packet was lost or modified by an attacker? Sometimes you don't even care about secrecy. So if you send network packets, the, the headers, uh, for example, in a TCP packet, they have to be left in clear because you want to, to leave the origin and source address in clear. Uh, but you don't want this to be uh, corrupted by an, attack, by an attacker. So sometimes we don't care about secrecy, we just want authenticity. We also have the notion of anonymity. You want to talk to someone, but you don't want that an eavesdropper might determine who's talking to whom. That's so extremely important uh, these days. And also, people outside of our community, they usually see crypto as just a bunch of ciphers, stuff that encrypt messages. But as we know, it's much more than that. It's much more than ciphers. It's also modes of operations, how you combine the primitive building blocks of cryptography to make new things. Like how do you combine AES, the AES encryption function, to do an actual useful cipher, the CBC, CTR techniques. Uh, so the, the protocols, how do you combine the cryptographic components to talk to each other? You are two, two persons. So how do you use cryptography to communicate securely? If you're more than two people, how, how do you do? So all those protocols and functionalities using, for example, of multi-party computation, which is maybe the most advanced type of protocol. So we have all these components, and people have been writing tons and tons of papers, and people have been taking this way more seriously than before. Seriously in the sense, uh, first of all, because if you're in the government of military, it can be a matter of death or life. And also from the scientific academic point of view, they took it seriously in the sense that you can apply mathematical concepts, mathematical formalism, uh, and equations to make this closer to a science. So I always see crypto as a mix of science, tradecraft, and art sometimes. I think it's really a mix of everything. But in the 90s, the focus was really on yeah, making it more, more formal, more mathematical, and we have all the security proofs. And like in every new, uh, well, every new domain, people are like extremely enthusiastic, say, oh, this new ID, this new paradigm, it will solve all our problems. The paradigm of the 90s was like, oh, the probable security, we can just prove that everything's secure and it will be fine. And of course it was great, we had tons of research, very nice results, probable security for, for example, RSA or AP, uh, prove that breaking this cipher is, or breaking this protocol is at least as hard as solving this hard problem. What well, a hard problem is typically factorization or, or discrete log. But it cannot only do so much as we, as we know. So the bottom line is that the, in the two, early 2000s we already have had tons of ciphers, tons of protocols, but many of them were not used and weren't just here for writing papers and people writing papers about the previous papers and people writing papers about the new papers and being happy because they had new publications. But at some point, uh, we have to ask a question, okay, how useful is our, is our research? 
for example, I often say that if you look at AES, or uh, if you look at even the ghost, uh, the ghost encryption function in the Russian standard, or SHA-2, SHA-3, I, I believe that this algorithm will never be broken. But never in, in the sense that, you know, never ever. Not, uh, maybe implementations might be weak, but the algorithm itself, I believe that it's as strong as uh, anything as long as P is not equal to NP. So we have tons of protocols. When non-cryptographers think of protocols, they think of maybe the Fielman, but we have multi-party competition, we have zero knowledge protocol, we have e-voting, secret sharing, ring signatures, group signature, distance bounding, identification. So part of this stuff is used in, in practice, but the big part is not used. It's extremely interesting for me a mathematical point of view, but nobody uses it, so what's the point? So it, the bottom line is that a lot of stuff is not used, and research is sometimes more motivated by research only, by the intellectual curiosity, by the idea of writing new papers, having new ideas, but not helping people, helping a uh, problem of the society or, or of the industry. And I don't blame the researchers because their job is sometimes to write paper, not to help people. So, so you can see it as, as we've reached the point of diminishing returns, we've solved a big part of our problems. And now we keep working, but the more effort we put in, the less return we have in comparison of the efforts. So now, uh, where are we today? So I don't know if you use this, this thing called Snapchat. Uh, maybe two or four days, I just installed it a few weeks ago. It's for the, the cool kids this day. Uh, they like it. it might look stupid and futile to you, but there's very good cryptography behind. There's very good cryptographers behind. Maybe, you know, Moti Young is working for Snapchat. And that's the, the crypto today, it's this kind of application. So what has changed in the last few years? Uh, so some buzzword warning. Uh, I don't necessarily like to use the words cloud and IoT, but yeah, you know what I mean, that's the fact uh, everything is cloud connected today. Uh, IoT means that many devices, many portable and mobile devices, not only phones, are connected to internet, talking to each other, and sometimes have some security. Very often they have at least some TLS stack to be able to talk to a, to a server security. What has changed the game a lot too is the revelation of uh, Snowden, because Cryptography became a household word, uh, word after the Snowden revelations, and many people started taking cryptography seriously, or maybe even too seriously. And a lot of people maybe became too paranoid, so oh, we have to encrypt everything because NSA, because... Uh. So, I don't know. What's also happening is like um, Mark Anderson says software is eating the world, everything becomes software because software is so, is so affordable and relatively easy and cheap to write, everyone can learn how to program and create an application in his garage and change the world. So at the end of the day, crypto is just a small part of the game, it's a very small component of the IT security game, and we have to, to, to acknowledge this. Uh, it's not enough to say, okay, I'm gonna encrypt stuff and then I'll be fine. There's many, many ways security can go wrong and crypto is just a small part of it. So for this new world, we need maybe a new, a new perspective, a new kind of crypto. It can no longer be isolated from the applications. Uh, I think the cryptographer need to sit together not only between themselves but also with other people to understand their needs and tell to the developers what crypto can bring to the table and how crypto can maybe solve their problems. So we need to catch up with reality. And so my friend Greg, he, yeah, he heard this, um, well, actually from me, uh, he didn't say it, but uh, I've seen a place where Cryptographers, a research paper, they say, oh, it's a real world attack, but in this case, it's not in our model, which totally makes no sense. So, among the new needs, uh, I will not go in every detail here, but what has changed a lot, we need to make crypto usable or user friendly in terms of user interface, in terms of API, because cryptographers, we tend to make systems so complex because we like complexity, that's part of our job, but other people, they don't like it, they, they hate complexity, so we have to simplify things for them. And in terms of application, we also have to think about the new, uh, the new needs. 
we have a big focus on privacy, protecting people's uh, private sphere, private information, be just personally identifiable information or their own behavior, who we talk to, for example. And also anonymity. Many people online are concerned about their anonymity online. So cryptography is a component of a system, a small component, but a very important one. Without cryptography, you can do any security at all. And like I said, we need to do a better job at explaining how, how crypto works for other people. We like, you know, to to show us as, you know, uh, crypto is some kind of voodoo, magic, it's super complex. Uh, only we can understand it, but I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty simple. It's like as stupid as this. The one type pan encrypted with ES counter, you don't need to know any crypto to understand this. You get the message, you get the one time pad, and you XR or you add or you do any commutative operation. And so that's how you encrypt and how you, you decrypt. Um, okay, this is another simplification, but you get my point. We, we need to make it look more simple without hiding the, the complexity anyway. So the, the new need, we, we need to focus less on the building blocks and the actual ciphers. Oh, we need a new lightweight block cipher or ultra lightweight hash function. And we have ciphers, we have hash functions, we have everything you need. Now we need to design protocols that are actually useful and that use the systems, these, these primitives. And I also try, every time I talk to academic cryptographers, to encourage them to publish the code. So some people say, yeah, show the code or it didn't happen or POC GTFO or however you call it. But I mean, if you do an attack, you claim to have an attack on a cipher and you don't make your research reproducible. You don't uh, allow anyone to verify that your result is correct and we just have to trust you. And maybe you lied or maybe the researchers have a wrong attack and they didn't, they don't know it because they didn't implement it themselves. Uh, so that's how reality works. You have to make the extra mile and write the code and share the code with the people so that they can verify your research. So how can we adapt generally to this new um, this new situation? Uh, so generally, crypto has become much more multidisciplinary. It's not just math. Uh, it's also coding and software engineering and sometimes reverse engineering. Because if you want people to use the crypto, they would have to implement it. So you have to care about the implementation aspects of it. And more generally, I think maybe fewer hard skills like pure mathematical skills and more soft skills in the sense of maybe software, in the sense of usability, in the sense of, of communication, in, in the sense of understanding people's needs. So Moti Jung, who is a very well respected cryptographer with a strong academic background and now working for Snap, he, 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 he told this on uh, the real world crypto in last January, he said, when a software engineer says it's impossible, it just means that it's cryptographically interesting, and I totally second this this thought because many times in my job people said, "Oh, man, you can do this." I was like, "Well, I actually you can using crypto," and that's pretty telling to notice that this new conference, well, relatively new, it was created maybe three or four years ago. It's called Real World Crypto. And just the title, it's interesting because it means that the other conferences, they are not real world and they're like, what, fantasy world with unicorns and, you know, Harry Potter, this stuff. And now he really took over crypto, which was the major crypto conference. Now, many more people are interested in, in real world crypto and many more people like attend this conference than crypto conference. If you look at the crypto program, it's just uh, extremely sophisticated research. But nobody in the real world, nobody uh, who's doing actually useful stuff cares about what is done at crypto, honestly. So that's relatively sad from my point of view. So I would like to give you now a few examples of innovative, relevant cryptographic works that have been done outside of the academic community and yet that are very good works from my point of view. So you have, for example, TLS, the new TLS 1.3 which was created by a consortium of people from industry with some obvious some input from um, academia. But TLS is maybe the one single most important protocol on the internet and it's driven by, uh, by industry partners. Uh, the Signal protocol, maybe you, you know Signal, the communication uh, application. So it, they were using new, they had to design new protocols to enable this kind of secure communications over 
a mobile uh, in a mobile setting where you have one mobile phone, another mobile phone, and in between you need to have a server because uh, except using WebRTC or other trace, you can't get the phones to talk directly to each other. So they developed a new key agreement called X3DH, they developed a new, uh, I would say, key update mechanism called Double Ratchet, and now that's the, uh, the standard, it's used by WhatsApp, it's used by Facebook Messenger, it's used by Google Allo, it's used pretty much uh, everywhere. The nice protocol is, uh, it's a kind of, uh, you can see it as a kind of TLS, it's a kind of client server transport protocol that is used by WhatsApp too, and it's designed by Trevor Perrin mostly, the, one of the same guys who's behind the signal protocol. Um, also, this, this is the wire application that's using a protocol similar to the one uh, of Signal, but it's also doing something very interesting. It's trying to ensure end-to-end -end security in the uh, multi-device setting and in the group setting. So how do you ensure end-to-end -end encryption when you have uh, many people talking, many people like people entering the session, leaving the session, and you need to have all of this end-to-end -end encrypted data messages and also files encrypted securely on different devices and you might you know log into a new device you might trust an old device you have to manage all this stuff and it's extremely complex and it do it pretty well so far another innovation uh, by my friend Jason is a uh, WireGuard it's a stealth VPN uh, it's much smarter than open VPN for example in the sense if you run a server for WireGuard then you can only detect that a host is running the server if you have already established a session with this guy, because otherwise it will not tell you, hey, I'm running this protocol, I have this, uh, I have this port open, it's all over UDP. And he initially created it based on IDZ had to uh, exfiltrate data uh, from rootkits. Uh, so when you do rootkit, you, want, you don't want to be detected, and that's some idea that he used to create this, uh, this protocol. So obviously all the blockchain research, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the hundreds of altcoins we have, it's in most cases not uh, purely academic research. Maybe one exception is uh, Zcash, zero cash. Uh, obviously the, the Tor network, so it's a different setting, but the, all the internal cryptography of Tor, uh, it, as a cryptographer, when you look at it, it's, it looks a bit strange, but it seems to work more or less. And again, it's a project that it's partly founded by the US government, and it's also run by a bunch of uh, activists, uh, which sometimes creates some uh, different strange situations. But a lot of people use it and a lot of people rely on this crypto for their uh, anonymity. Uh, another case is Let's Encrypt. So I don't know if you already configured the TLS server where you have to generate uh, the, the CR server, then ask for a certificate and then put a certificate file on your server, put the right permission, servicing, and most of the time you will get it wrong the first time you do it. So Let's Encrypt is just a small set of scripts that allows you to enable HTTPS, uh, so TLS connections on your server by just using one simple command. It's extremely simple and relatively effective. So effective that many uh, malware people use it too. Um, Taholaf sits um, created by, um, by Zuko, uh, one of the guys behind ZeroCache and Blake2, and it's a decentralized cloud storage system, it's not new. It, they started this project maybe you know, at least four or five years ago, maybe even more. And the idea is to distribute your data over different nodes in a reliable way. And so that only you can decrypt your data and the server has no way to, to decrypt it. So it looks simple, but in practice, it's, there's a lot of uh, cryptography and security engineering problems to solve. And it seems to work so well that they created a company to, to sell it. So the, the bottom line from this is that when you see it, it really looks like today innovation between the blockchain or cloud or IoT or mobile fields comes from the industry or the open source communities, people who are directly exposed to this kind of, of problems. And as a matter of fact, academia tries to follow, tries to, to catch up, but they have much less expositions to this kind of problem, so they have, it's more difficult for academia to solve these problems in the first place because they don't know that the problem exists. Uh, but what they can try to provide is to 
like more formal framework, deeper analysis. If you look, for example, at TLS or at the signal protocol, um, my friend Nadim wrote a very nice paper where he formally verified with other people the correctness of these protocols and of their implementations. So when you have this kind of guarantee formal verification, it gives you even more assurance that the implementation of the protocol does what it's supposed to do. Uh, maybe one small exception. I don't know how much time left I have. Okay. One exception where academia is um, the most, uh, the principal actor is uh, post quantum crypto. So maybe you know the, the project from the uh, US, US standard organizations, NIST, uh, the post quantum crypto project. So the idea is uh, to like they did for AES, like they did for SHA 3, to ask people for submissions of algorithms that would be resistant to a quantum computer. So there's no quantum computer today, there will probably not be any quantum computer, any useful quantum computer in the next 10 years. My personal opinion, which is just my personal opinion, is that you won't see one in your lifetime, even in the next century. Uh, because today the best we have is a thing with maybe 5 or 15 quantum bits or qubits, and you can hardly factor a number of such as 15 into 3 and 5. And if you want to break uh, RSA or elliptic or Diffie Hellman, which you can do in theory with a quantum computer because it runs different kinds of algorithms, you would need not, for example, for RSA and 2000 bits, you would need not 2000 qubits, but you would need millions of qubits. And millions of qubits kept stable for weeks or months with error correction and everything, so it looks extremely difficult from where we are today. And what's interesting when you read the news uh, and the news about papers by people who want to are seeking money to work on this, it really looks like when computers are about to appear like tomorrow or next week, and I mean we have to do something now. But when you talk privately to researchers, they tell you a completely different story. They tell you that man, it's, we are extremely far from this. It's extremely interesting, of course but we're not sure at all that it will happen. So this kind of project, I usually present it as an insurance. Quantum computers may or may not happen. Maybe they have a chance one over a billion to appear in the next century. But if they do happen, man, they will destroy all our crypto. So we better be prepared for this. So that's the point of this kind of project. And as far as I can tell, most of the submissions to the post quantum crypto projects will come from academia. I know a few exceptions. But many algorithms are actually mathematical, like the latest based crypto for key change or encryption. Most of the work is uh, from academia. So to summarize this uh, talk in very high general terms, um, so we as cryptographers, wherever we are, industry, academia, or government, it's good to focus on crypto, but we need to maybe step out and go out of our comfort zone and learn about the people who use crypto, but what are the technology they use? Uh, how does IoT cloud things work? What are the problems there? And what can we do to help? And you acknowledge that our research can not only be about uh, algorithms that only cryptographers care about, but has to solve real problems to um, well to be meaningful. And I mean, at the end of, of the day, your career is oh. I have solved some actual problems and people have been using my research and I'm happy about it and it's different that I've just published a bunch of papers that nobody cared about. So I mean it's a win-win game for everyone. So, so I don't know if you agree or disagree but uh, I'll be happy to take any question and thank you for your attention.